Okay, I'm going to do a little quiz with you uh, first. So, the question is, who am I? I am step being social. <laughs> I am connecting with my friends right now. I'm connecting to the outside world, so I'm really sorry, you real people out there <laughs> who came to this event. I'm too busy because I'm being social. <laughs> In the early days, a social person was someone with a friendly face, someone who would easily chat to other people, but now I can actually be grumpy and still make new friends. <laughs> <laughs> and I can also be shy, so nobody sees it. You're still here, right? <laughs> <laughs> this new social person is not being liked by everyone, unfortunately, because originally I'm from Holland, and I have to say they're still a bit conservative right there. They think it's impolite or even rude to play with your Blackberry during dinner with your friends. So I'm very happy to be here in Indonesia. <laughs> I can go on and on, chatting with my friends, pretending to be listening to the person next to me, and nobody would ever complain. <laughs> this new social person, I predict, will look slightly different in the future. We will grow one big arm. <laughs> we have long fingers, our nails will be very sensitive, our ears and our mouth will be small, because there's not much listening nor talking involved. The hat will be very big, though, because we are multitasking, right? We have to be able to chat with our friends here and still pretend to be listening to the person next to us. Our eyes will also be very large because we have to be able to read all this stuff <laughs> on this very small screen. So this is how we're going to look at it. <laughs> Good old Tweety. Good old Tweety would never have imagined that hundreds of millions of people are going to be Tweeties. Tweeting day in, day out. And I have to admit, I am a Tweety. I'm actually this very sad person who gets up in the morning, first thing I do, check my Blackberry. Look at the tweets I missed overnight, like something important, right? So I'm scrolling and scrolling and I'm wondering, why am I doing this? Why is this important? Has my life been reduced to 140 character statements of random people? <laughs> and what do I find? This is my 15-year-old uh, nephew in Holland. He has been tweeting 22,000 times already this year. And this might sound exotic to you because it's in Dutch, but what does he tweet? I'm still in bed, haha. -ha. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bored to death. My, mood, my mom is stupid. <laughs> and I'm now going downstairs for breakfast. So why do I need to know this? <laughs> <laughs> Researchers have found that 40% of what we are tweeting is pointless babble <laughs> compar compared to 4% news. But some others have described it in a more gentle way. They call it social grooming. <laughs> and we don't do social grooming so much anymore. When was the last time you were looking for headlines in your friends here? <laughs> or picking your friend's nose? Social grooming is important. It connects us to other people. It gives us a feeling of trust and comfort. I can remember when I was growing up, my mom asked me to scratch her back. And it sort of gives me a, a sense of belonging. It's important. We have lost that. Our communities these days have fallen apart. Look at how we live in the cities. So we're looking for new communities, a new sense of belonging. And sharing pointless babble through Twitter or Facebook apparently gives us these new communities. So these new communities are Twitter and Facebook. So I'm happy to be living in the Twitter capital of the world. <laughs> Jakarta. I'll give you some statistics. 47 million Facebook users in Indonesia. Number four in the world after the US, Brazil and India. And that for a country where hardly anyone owns a laptop or a computer, at least a huge part of the population. Twitter uses 30 million, number five in the world, after the US, Brazil, UK, and Germany. So, for me, as a journalist, I work for Al Jazeera, my life has become a lot more easy because of Twitter. 
What I do if there's a riot or a big breaking news story, a disaster, I check Twitter. It's the fastest medium right now. Before I would use like uh, maybe the internet or go uh, watch TV, but now the tweets are so much faster. So I get my news from there. And what I do is I tweet back. I say, where are you? Can you give me some eyewitness report? Some, you know, uh, can I contact you? Can I interview you for Al Jazeera? And people retweet, they reply to me. So my life has become a lot easier since Twitter. And it also has become one of the fastest search and find instruments in the world. I'll explain that to you. When we travel for Al Jazeera, we often go to very remote places. And what happens if you go to a remote place? The equipment breaks down. So what I do now, and it really has proven very successful, I put out a tweet. I said, I am in Malang, or I am in Palankaraya. I'm looking for this and this type of camera because it just broke down. Can someone help the Al Jazeera crew, please? And within no time, I can, I can promise you that, they are replying. They are replying from all over the country. One person replies to the other, and it gets closer to Palankaraya. In like 10 minutes, I find someone with a camera right there. So now, I make, we are making bets with the team of Al Jazeera. How much time will it take us to find this camera? Okay. So the record was basically 15 minutes once when we were in Malang and uh, we were shooting a story, camera broke down. Within 15 minutes, we had a, we had a replacement. So I love Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I love the social media. So why is it so popular here in Indonesia? <laughs> we have not much else to do. <laughs> we're stuck for hours and hours, bored to death thinking of the most brilliant, intelligent tweets that we can come up with. <laughs> but it's not the real reason, of course. Indonesians like to connect. They are very social, they like to gossip, and they don't care much about their privacy. <laughs> Look at me, I've been here for 15 years, I put my whole life out there on Facebook for everyone to see. Pictures of my son, holidays with my family, everything is there, people I hang out with, and I'm wondering, you know, why do we do this? Have we created some kind of fake reality show of our lives? Is that real? Of course we're not going to put our real lives out there because that sometimes wouldn't be that happy or maybe a bit gloomy, right? And you get some weird things sometimes because for some reason Al Jazeera is widely watched in Africa. So I have Facebook friends from Kenya, Zimbabwe, Uganda, and the other day, a few months ago, this 19-year-old man from Uganda, he asked me to marry him <laughs> on Facebook. And I was wondering, I told him, I don't think we really know each other, do we? <laughs> we only chatted like, how are you? And I, I thanked him for watching my stories on Al Jazeera. But then I was thinking about it, and then I was looking at my, at my own profile on Facebook, and I thought, he probably thinks he does know me because I've put like 600 pictures out there my whole life, maybe for the last eight years. When was Facebook invented? It's all out there. So he probably knew, he thought he knew me. So these are the sites of Facebook and Twitter a lot of people are very hesitant about, or they actually laugh about. It can be quite ironic, right? What I'm here today is to tell you the positive side of the social media. We are facing a revolution right now. Despite all the skepticism and the irony, I think something is really changing right here. And I'm giving you the story of Agil. Agil is an 18-year-old boy, and he grew up together with my son, Agus, in central Jakarta. Agus living in a very comfortable house. Agil living in a two-room kampung house, uh, sleeping on the floor with his family of six, living of a few dollars a day. His parents are both illiterate. He never owned a laptop or a computer, but he's one of the most active Facebook and Twitter people I've ever met. So how does he do that? One thing is, he has a Blackberry. Blackberries are very cheap in Indonesia. So he, I bought him one, but his friends also have Blackberries. So that's how they communicate. And the other thing is, they're here in this so-called Warung Internet 
Warnet, they call it. It's basically the Indonesian version of an internet cafe. You can't really see it, but there's a lot of old uh, computers standing there, and for a few cents, you can just go online there and, and communicate and log on to the world. So that's how he sends out his thoughts, his, his messages, his visions, and shares them with more than 600 Facebook friends and 88 followers on Twitter. So why do I call this a revolution? Because it doesn't matter if he's rich or poor, if he's educated or not, if he's from an important family or nobody at all, he can go online. He has gotten a voice. He never had that voice with a traditional media. Never a television or radio or newspaper reporter would show up and, and ask him his, his story. Now he can just go online and tell his own story. It's exactly what we did with Al Jazeera six years ago when we started the New English Channel. We basically said we want to give a voice to the voiceless. Well, that's exactly what the social media are doing on a much larger scale than, than Al Jazeera could have ever imagined. So I thought I was pretty cool, right? Working for TV, being famous, maybe being recognized on the street. But now I realized I'm working for a dinosaur medium. We're dying. TV is dying. If you have like tens of thousands Twitter followers, and there's one person here in Indonesia, Agnes Monica, who has six million Twitter followers, then you have a following, then you have an audience. And the good thing about Twitter is that you actually know that the people who are connected to you actually read what you're tweeting. In my case, I still have to be lucky. I'm traveling for a couple of days, going to Kalimantan, 20 hours on the road, doing this story about climate change. It takes me maybe a week to get the whole thing together, put it on air. The, the people who are supposed to watch it happen to be in the toilet. <laughs> or they are making coffee in the kitchen. The time that we are actually consuming news at a certain time and location is gone. I think it's only my parents who sit down at 8 o'clock every evening to watch the 8 o'clock news. We don't do that anymore. We want to consume news and gossip at any time of the day, any place we are. So that's why, you know, the social campaigning has proven very, very powerful. Like what happened uh, the other day with the Anti-Corruption Commission and the police, when the police was being investigated by the Anti-Corruption Commission, and everyone was wondering, why, why does the president, President Yudhoyono, not speak out? Twitter went wild for days. And then, finally, when the president spoke out, he said, he didn't say, I felt pressured by the TV or by radio or newspapers. No, he said, I felt pressured by social media. And that's the power, of course. And so many things have happened in Indonesia on Twitter recently. Look at what happened with the election of the governor of Jakarta. Basically, most of his election campaign was on Twitter. So that's the power. And one of the campaigns that I really like is this one. There's a man in uh, West Java, and I did a story about this, who is building bridges for children to go to school. Because they're not that good anymore, as you can see. And the government is not doing any, anything, actually. And I've seen children wading through the river to go to school and risking their lives. So he started this Facebook campaign. And he, his campaign was, I want to build 100 bridges for school children. Within a few weeks, he had enough money for 200 bridges. So that's the success and the power of social media. But the downside is also that becoming an activist has become very easy. It's a very lazy thing to do. You just sit indoors at your laptop, and the only thing you need to do is retweet. Did you actually read what you're retweeting? I, I often wonder, right? So there's a term for that now. It's called slacktivism. It's a lazy <laughs> form of activism. And in Indonesia, in Jakarta, it's maybe quite comfortable not to go on the street, get all sweaty and, and, and dirty protesting at the Bundaran Hai, at the center of the city. And maybe you want to demonstrate against thugs who are violent against minorities, so you don't really want to face them in real life. So it's comfortable to be able to sit indoors and, and tweet from, in, from there. But the question is, are we not 
becoming like fake activists? Is this really, do we really know the cases that we are supporting right now? But I think, to be honest, the power of social media is not that. It's going back to the social grooming. I think what social media is doing is connecting souls. We are basically creating a new human identity. A human identity that goes beyond race, nationality, religion. Basically, we're creating a global brain, a global identity. And that could be the beginning of world peace. <laughs> if it would be that easy, if we would all connect online, all conflicts and wars would be over. Because some people are still very hesitant. People, especially from my generation, they don't believe in this social media thing. But I don't think it's that easy, of course. But the beginning is awareness. I think every change starts with awareness. And what I'm seeing now with Agil and his friends, they are becoming aware. They know what's happening around them. And I don't even think that the government realizes that this movement is happening because there's 30 million, 40 million, 50 million Agils out there in Indonesia. We're basically living in two different worlds right now. This world, the digital world, and the real world. You, you people. And I think, of course, we're turning in these social people who are behaving antisocial. And yes, I think that's annoying. And yes, I think it's still better to talk to a real person in real life because you see the person's expression and you can see the body movements and more importantly, you can smell that person. But I do believe if we can combine those two worlds in a smart way, we're heading up to a very new world. Thank you.